Good evening. Good evening. I am Mark Updegrove, the director of the OBJ Presidential Library, and it is uh, my great pleasure to welcome you here tonight for the last program of the 2016 calendar year. And I want to just start off by thanking you for your support of the Friends of the LBJ program. I, I, there, there are so many of you that I've met either here before or after programs or in and around town, some on airplanes, uh, and uh, frequently on airplanes, funnily enough. And uh, you're always so kind uh, about expressing your gratitude for this program and what we do. And uh, that means a great deal to me. And so I thank you for your support. We try to do what we do as well as we can possibly do it. Uh, and uh, we appreciate when you recognize what we put into this program. And also we, we appreciate when you bring new members to the Friends of the LBJ Library Program. So thank you for that as well. I also wanna thank our sponsors, the Moody Foundation, St. David's Healthcare, Frost Bank, and the University Federal Credit Union. We appreciate your support. And finally, I appreciate the partnership of, uh, of Humanities Texas. Uh, my friend Mike Gillette, the executive director, suggested this program tonight, and I uh, quickly jumped on the idea. David Oshinsky is an old friend, and um, I'm delighted that he came back to Austin. Hopefully he won't be so quick to leave this time. Uh, we loved having him as a faculty member here at UT, and it's great to see David and his wife, Jane, back. So it's my great pleasure to cede the podium to my friend, Mike Gillette, the Executive Director of Humanities Texas, who will introduce tonight's, tonight's guests. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. It's, it's always an honor to join forces with you and your superb staff here at LBJ. Uh, Mark Updegrove has been Humanities Texas host and collaborator at so many of our professional development institutes for classroom teachers, uh, where we work together to improve the quality of public education in Texas. And believe me, when new teachers have an opportunity to spend three days with historians like David Oshinsky and Bill Brands, the experience can be transformative. Now, as all of you know, Mark is a master at bringing the most extraordinary speakers to this library, including presidents and Pulitzer Prize winners. Well, tonight is no exception. To serve as moderator, Mark has enlisted the distinguished founding dean of the university's new Dell Medical School. Dr. Clay Johnston holds degrees from Amherst and Harvard Medical School, as well as a PhD from Berkeley. Before coming to Austin, he spent 20 years at the University of California at San Francisco's Fine Medical School, where he specialized in neurology and epidemiology. Epidemiology? <laughs> Epidemiology, I think it is. Is that right? That's, right. that's close. That's, that's why we need him to talk to David Oshinsky right there. <laughs> David Oshinsky comes to us from New York University. There he directs the Division of Medical Humanities and serves on the history faculty. But he is, of course, no stranger to Austin, having been on the UT history faculty for 12 years. His first book, the, A Conspiracy So Immense, The World of Joe McCarthy, received this library's D.B. Hardiman Prize for the best book on Congress in 1984, and it was this prize that brought David to Austin for the first time. And David not only writes books that are immensely readable, he also writes history that matters, that makes a difference. His Pulitzer Prize winning book, Polio, An American Story, is a prime example. The book influenced Bill Gates to make the worldwide eradication of polio the top priority of the Gates Foundation. David's splendid new book, Bellevue, Three Centuries of Medicine and Mayhem at America's Most Storied Hospital 
is also likely to have a powerful impact, inspiring our better angels by transporting us to a very special place where, there, where no one is in need of health care as turned away. So please welcome Dr. Clay Johnson and Dr. David Oshinsky. Austin and the poet, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's, a, it's a great pleasure to be up here with you, David. Thank you for coming back to My Austin. My pleasure. Always good to be back in Austin. Yeah, yeah. We, as, as was mentioned, you were, you, know, you were here for almost 12 years. And, I was. Yeah. 12 wonderful years. And if we're up to my wife, we'd pack up the moving truck and head back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, we've been thinking about a medical humanities program as part of the medical school, so maybe I'll talk to her <laughs> about how we might get you back. Thank you. Um, so um, the polio book, an amazing book. Thank um, you. And, uh, you know, the... Really great as an epidemiologist, and that's the way you say it. Um, <laughs> the um, you know reading that book and understanding the impact of epidemiology right. and medicine on on health, I mean, just a, a dramatic story. Um, and maybe we'll return to that a little later. But sure. that was ten years ago. What it took was. so long? What took me so long? Um, Bellevue is first a very complicated subject. Um, it's a hospital, uh, I guess, that we'll talk about in, in a little bit. It's, um, uh, when you think about Bellevue, you think about numerous things. One is <clears throat> it's got a reputation for its psychiatric wards. Uh, when I was a kid, I'm, I'm a New Yorker, and when I was growing up, if you acted a little bit weird, your mother would say, it's Bellevue. You're on your way to Bellevue. <laughs> And that, that was, and, and Bellevue also happened to be close to Greenwich Village, so an, an, awful, an awful large number of writers, uh, Norman Mailer, uh, William Burroughs, Allen Ginsberg, all for some reason wound up in, for psychiatric reasons, wound up in, uh, in Bellevue. Um, and, but Bellevue is also a place uh, where the medicine is so good that if a cop is shot, uh, in, in Manhattan, he goes to Bellevue. If a fireman is overcome with smoke, he goes to Bellevue. If a construction worker falls off the site, he goes to Bellevue. Um, if the pope or the president were to take sick in New York City, Bellevue is the place where they would be taken. And, and the other aspect is that Bellevue has long been a hospital of immigrants in New York City. And by that, I mean that every group from the Irish to the Germans to the Jews to the Italians to the African Americans coming up in the Great Migration uh, used Bellevue as their hospital. It was the poor person's hospital. It was the hospital that turned no one away. Um, and it's always had that reputation. And it's changed now. New immigrants have come in, but the mission of compassionate care for those who really cannot pay for it um, has, has long been uh, uh, the standard at Bellevue Hospital. And then honestly, when you throw in the fact that I had to begin a medical humanities program um, at NYU, and um, we moved up from Austin, and if my wife hadn't tied me up uh, for two years, literally with rope, we would have been in New York City much more quickly. Yeah. <laughs> Again, I need to talk to your wife. Um, so, so um, you know, d during your time in Austin, um, I know you must have had some, some happy memories because this is where you were when you got the Pulitzer. Pulitzer it was. I, I, I was thrilled uh, to win the Pulitzer um, at the University of Texas. And I, I always tell a number of stories which the, I think the audience might enjoy. Um, I found out I was one of three finalists for the prize. The other was um, a scholar at Harvard who was working on slavery. Uh, the second was a scholar at Princeton who was working on democracy. And I was at the University of Texas working on polio. So I figured my chances of women winning were slim to none. Indeed, my chances were so slim, I thought that my wife, Jane, actually went shopping on the day of the announcement in New Orleans. Um, and I called her up and I said, uh, Jane, we won, we won. 
and she was in a store in New Orleans, and the salesperson said, what did he win? And she said, my husband won the Pulitzer Prize. And the salesperson said, oh, I thought it was Powerball. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there's, there's one more story for those of you who are longtime Austinites. When Jane did come back, um, one of the great things that Bill Powers did was that for the first time, I think, for a non-athletic victory, they lit the tower orange. <laughs> when, uh, when, yeah. That's great. And, uh, and, and my wife and I were walking at the tower, and two uh, young women were walking in the other direction. And my wife, Jane, said, do you know why they lit the tower orange? And the first woman said, I, I don't have a clue. And Jane turned to the second woman and said, do you have any idea? And the young woman said, was Vince drafted? <laughs> so we realized there were sort of gradations in, uh, yeah. in, in doing this. But we had um, wonderful years. I, the history department is so strong at the University of Texas. Um, I made wonderful friends there. Uh, one of my best being Bill Brands, who's in the audience, our great historian of yeah every imaginable subject. Um, so we just loved the life here and, um, and the people, and, and leaving was very, very difficult. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm sure the startup package at NYU was the similar type to the football coaches and how they, what they yeah, did here. Yeah, so it's sort of like uh, away as well. Charlie Strong minus all the money. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so these last two books, both about health, Mm -hmm. um, epidemiology, but really about medicine, a transformation of, of um, the entire community getting involved in, in addressing a major health issue, maybe even the major health issue of that age in terms mm -hmm. of the you know, polio being so, so dramatic in its effects and hitting anyone and at any time. And then this time, another health topic, different but with some similarities, what draws you to, uh, to these topics? Well, um, I think in the case of polio, <clears throat> I had been born before the uh, two vaccines that they, we, they didn't cure polio, but they ended polio, basically, by preventing it. Um, so I really understood what life was like before that and what life was like after that. And what I wanted to do was to write a book, not only about the race for the vaccines, but about how the American people mobilized through the March of Dimes voluntarily without any government intervention mm -hmm. to really provide the resources that allowed Salk and Sabin and so many others um, to do what they had to do to end the scourge of polio. And I thought that there was a message there, particularly in a society, even in the United States, where vaccination rates are tricky now. There are many younger families who have never seen something like polio and wonder why they should vaccinate their children. And as you know, uh, one of the extraordinary things about vaccines is that they work so well that they sort of, people don't understand the problems that they've solved. There is no polio because we do vaccinate. So there really was a message there. And I think in the Bellevue book, my message was that healthcare is a human right. Um, and what New York City, New York City for all of its problems has always guaranteed free medical care for the indigent. And Bellevue as its flagship public hospital was really the engine that drove that dream and that reality for almost three centuries and continues to do so. Yes, I, I, wanna, I wanna talk about that because I think that's a remarkable um, part of the history that you tell, and a remarkable, um, I don't know if it's a legacy of Bellevue, Bellevue. I mean, it was the, the first to be set up this way. Right. Now there are many, many other hospitals um, um, across the, the, the country with a similar um, economic base where they yes. receive support from the local government in order to right. provide um, care for everyone. But, um, but I, I want to go back to that. I mean, I, I just... I've, Sometimes when you look back in history, you're embarrassed. You know, the, the, um, uh, 
racism, bigotry, and it all comes out in your book as well. Um, but in but that lack of mean spiritedness to recognize, oh, we should provide health care to everyone. Mm -hmm. um, it's there from the get go. It's there it back really in the was. 18th century. It really was. Um, one of the things that I, I found most interesting, Bellevue is the oldest hospital in the United States. I mean, there's some debate about that, but it goes back to 1736. And it really was started as part of the poorhouse. It was a wing of the poorhouse, so it was associated with helping the poor, but it was also associated as being a place for people who had no other options. Mm -hmm. They basically, that's where they had to go. And then what happens is New York City is hit with a bunch of devastating epidemics. Um, and in the 1700s, those epidemics are yellow fever, the smallpox, but particularly yellow fever, which comes up on the slave ships and reaches Philadelphia and New York. And Philadelphia, as you may know, yellow fever was so bad that the young American government, which was located in Philadelphia at the time, actually disbanded. And Washington and Jefferson fled to their native Virginia. Thomas Jefferson actually thought yellow fever wasn't so bad because he feared the growth of big cities. And he thought that an epidemic uh, made people understand that being close together caused very, very serious problems. But in New York City, what the city fathers did was to try to increase the size of Bellevue to take care of the victims of yellow fever. Now, if you picture New York City at this time, the entire population was down at the Battery, which is now where the Staten Island Ferry is. Um, so they wanted a place about two or three miles north, far enough away so that you could bring yellow fever victims. They would basically die um, and you could isolate them, and, and, and the belief was that you wouldn't get yellow fever, of course, right. was wrong. But the first doctor at Bellevue was a man named Alexander Anderson. He was 21, 22 years old. He had apprenticed with another physician. He went to take the job as the physician at Bellevue to take care of yellow fever patients because he believed it was his Christian duty to do so. And Alexander Anderson stayed at Bellevue with these dying patients. And in the time he was there, his son died of yellow fever, his brother died of yellow fever, his mother and father and wife all died of yellow fever. And Alexander Anderson, for the most part, stayed the course. And when his last diary entry for that year, 1798. He said, the Lord has tested me, the Lord has tried me, but this is what he wanted me to do. And I always look back on Alexander Anderson as providing the compassion. Um, I, I wouldn't say the medical knowledge, because what he was doing was bleeding and purging. Palliative care. Right, exactly. In, in, in uh, which was probably, way than, yes, than we, which was what you did in those days. Yeah. But it was the notion of, of providing kindness to mm -hmm. these people, of understanding the pain they were in, and staying the course while people around him were dying of the disease. And to me, that was sort of the credo of what would become the flagship hospital of New York City. Yeah, that's a that's a wonderful way of talking about it. I mean, I, it's the 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 concept of the hospital embodies those principles, and then it draws the people who who um, gain strength from that, who recognize that as their that, mission. That is right. Yeah. Um, do doctors would come to Bellevue for a number of reasons. Um, one was they believed it was their duty to do so. Um, as you know, Clay, by the, uh, by the Civil War, Bellevue was attracting some of the greatest medical minds in the country, mm -hmm. uh, particularly young people who wanted to come there to be interns and residents because A, when you were at Bellevue, you saw everything. Mm -hmm. There was no disease that was not part of the hospital existence. And these doctors perfectly well understood this. And the other was that these doctors were interested in experimentation. And what you had at Bellevue 
were uncomplaining bodies. Mm -hmm. These were poor people. Mm -hmm. and, and this was an era, an era before informed consent mm -hmm. and the like. And, and so doctors could pretty much have their way. They weren't doing Frankenstein-like experiments. They were doing things that they really thought would help the patients. But when you look back upon it, you can see that one of the reasons they came was the belief that they would see everything and also the belief that they could try everything on these patients. Yeah. Well, you know, and, and there, the issues of consent, of course, are one of those embarrassing things in history that you yes. look at and you say, yes. wow, I can't believe we ever did this. On the other hand, their, their interest in doing a better job was so critical. Um, Absolutely. And uh, I mean, some of the descriptions of how we were treating people in the 17th, 18th, even 19th, 20th centuries, um, if we didn't have people pushing that boundary, that is right. it, we, we would still all be going to the doctor to be forced to vomit and to be bled out. That, that, that is absolutely true. And, and when you look at Bellevue, you can see the kind of medical improvements that are occurring elsewhere in the country that are being experimented on at Bellevue. Yeah, what's your favorite? I mean, I'd, I, I'd say it would be antiseptic medicine. Mm -hmm. um, in the uh, by the Civil War era, they had anesthesia, which was enormously important. On the other hand, what anesthesia did in the old days before anesthesia. Um, you basically had to take an arm off in nine seconds. I'm not kidding you. Mm -hmm. You had to saw that arm off immediately or the patient would die of pain and would die of it, shock. And another re remarkable thing about the book is how much it is focused on trauma and trauma treatment. That is correct. Because at least there was some treatment that yes, was offered that, in that, a hospital that, that couldn't that be offered is, elsewhere that because is we right. didn't have treatment for pretty much anything else. But that, anyway, go, but go yeah. back to your... Um, so basically, what you had at Bellevue were surgeons who, with anesthesia, you know, could now look further into the body because the patient was not in pain and you could experiment more and do other things. The problem was without antiseptic medicine, um, half the patients who were operated upon at Bellevue would die of post-operative infection. And that was a huge issue. And what you see at Bellevue in the 1860s and 70s is a younger generation of people coming in like the great surgeon William Halstead. And they understand Pasteur and they understand Lister and they understand that you can't, as a surgeon, ride your horse to Bellevue, get off in the same clothes you were riding in, not wash your hands and begin to operate on a patient. What they wanted were sterilized instruments. They wanted very careful hand washing. They wanted starched uniforms. And there's this enormous battle at Bellevue that is fought out over these issues with the younger generations winning out. And as I think, as you know, I, you know, I, I think one of the things I hit upon very hard in the book is to take this arc of antiseptic medicine through the lives of three, three presidents. presidents. Yeah, right. yeah, so and good. I'm really glad a, you want to yeah. talk about that. So, so uh, compare and contrast. I shall. <laughs> the, I shall. The treatment and outcomes. I mean, because it's really remarkable. It tells such a great I, story. I will. There are um, some of you may not know that the young <clears throat> physician who rushed to Abraham Lincoln after Lincoln was shot at Ford's Theater was Charles Augustus Leal, who was 23 years old and had graduated from Bellevue Medical School about three months before the war was ending. He went down to Washington um, to be an assistant surgeon in a military hospital. Leal actually, at the theater, heard the shot, saw John Wilkes Booth jump to the floor of the stage and run out. And then he heard the cry, literally, is there a doctor in the house? And Charles Augustus Leal rushed to Lincoln's side and as a 22, 23-year-old doctor, literally held the fate of the Republic in his arms. Lincoln was mortally wounded, but Charles Leal did everything he was told to do that he had learned at Bellevue. He gave brandy and water to Lincoln. He wrapped Lincoln in a blanket. He told them not to move Lincoln back to the White House because the trip would kill him. So they just moved him across the street. And he also began to 
put his fingers near Lincoln's wound. And one of the things, Clay, I find very interesting is that Charles Augustus Leal um, believed in patient confidentiality and rarely, if ever, talked about what had happened that day. On the anniversary of Lincoln's 100th birthday, about 50 years later, Leal was asked to give a speech about Lincoln. And he gave this remarkable speech in which he said that he had given CPR to Lincoln, that he had worked on Lincoln's chest and breathed into Lincoln's mouth, but he made no mention of touching Lincoln's wound. And what often happens is that an historian rummaging through the Library of Congress just a couple of years ago came across an interview that Leal had done in 1865. The Surgeon General wanted to know what the hell happened. I mean, I want to, you know, blow by blow. And Leal sat down and gave this interview. And in the interview in 1865, Leal made no mention of CPR because it, no one was doing it at that time. And he did talk about putting his finger deep into Lincoln's head to look for bullet fragments. And this, of course, was an unwashed finger. And the question then remains, why would there be two versions? And the answer is that when Leal gave the speech in 1909, he really wanted the public to think that he was using all the methods of a 1909 physician, including antiseptic medicine. In the book, I give Leal a kind of a pass because he was young, he did everything right in 1865, and his final line is so poignant. He stayed with Abraham Lincoln right till the end, holding Lincoln's hand. And this was for 19 hours. And he was asked, why did you do that? And he said, about the president, in his blindness, I wanted him to know he had a friend. And that was the Bellevue Credo. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I always think about that when I think about Leal. Now, to just mm -hmm. delve a little bit further, Leal's mentor was Frank Hamilton, the great Civil War surgeon. And as some of you may know, in 1881, James Garfield was shot by an assassin um, in Washington. And Frank Hamilton was brought down from Bellevue. And this was, you know, he, he was the great Civil War surgeon. And the first thing Frank Hamilton did when he looked at Garfield was to put his finger into Garfield's wounds and use dirty probes. And this was after Listerian medicine had begun to take hold. Frank Hamilton was from the <coughs> old school. Immediately, Garfield began to have these enormous infections, a fever, and he died three months later. And it was clear that he had died from massive infection, and if that Frank Hamilton and other physicians had just left poor Garfield alone, he would have easily survived. And that is a really interesting story, and it got the public very interested in antiseptic medicine. I will say with Frank Hamilton, the one thing he did do after he was somewhat responsible for Garfield's death, he did remember to send a bill to Congress for $25,000, <laughs> which is about $600,000 today. <laughs> Let me finish the story and the arc. Fast forward 13 years to 1893, and Grover Cleveland, as president of the United States, goes to see his doctor, who is a Bellevue physician, and the doctor sees that Cleveland has a mass in his mouth. And he thinks it's cancerous. They send it to the Army Medical Center. It comes back as cancer. What these, do these Bellevue doctors now do is they outfit a yacht, because Grover Cleveland did not want anyone to know that he had cancer. It was during the Great Depression of 1893. He didn't want his enemy to alert his enemies and his critics. They outfitted a yacht as an operating room. It was done with every imaginable aspect of antiseptic medicine. Everything was sterilized. 
They took the yacht along the East River. As they went by Bellevue Hospital, they lowered the shades. The yacht went out into the Long Island Sound in a very calm part of the water. They removed the mass from Grover Cleveland's mouth. Grover Cleveland died, but it was 25 years later, of a heart attack. Mm -hmm. And what you can see is that, in some degree, the mistakes made on James Garfield probably helped save the life of Grover Cleveland. And what is extraordinary, from Charles Augustus Leal and Lincoln, to Frank Hamilton and Garfield, to the Bellevue doctors with Grover Cleveland, you see the arc of antiseptic medicine. And what antiseptic medicine did was to give people a sense that hospitals could do good. I can go to the hospital and be cured of something. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not going there to die anymore. You know, a lot of it had to do with the coming in of technology, nursing, x-ray machines. But antiseptic medicine was absolutely crucial. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, it's so interesting, too, that, you know, Hamilton was such a hero. He was a, a yes. Civil War hero and the best surgeon in the country. He was, yeah. And in, he was obviously resistant to some of these new ideas about antiseptic uh, practices. And a single case, so public, yes. really helped to drive a much more rapid and dramatic change. In, that, in the, you, you put it very, very well. Um, Joseph Lister the father of antiseptic medicine, who believed in the theories of Louis Pasteur. When Joseph Lister came to America, Frank Hamilton was brought to the speech that Lister gave to stand up and criticize Lister. And Frank Hamilton's argument, which was a very American argument, was, speaking of Pasteur and Lister, he said, why in God's name would an American listen to a Frenchman whose ideas have been taken on by an Englishman. And that, that, that was his argument. I hope he did that for humor and not as an actual argument, but I, <laughs> I suspect that's another example of an yeah. embarrassment from, yeah. uh, from history. So the, um, the whole notion of Bellevue as a madhouse, mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, it's really interesting. I mean, obviously, it, it has a psychiatric wing. It has for, for decades and mm -hmm. decades. Um, but tell us a little bit more about the, the namesake for your prize and some yes. of the work that he did um, in establishing that, uh, that sense of what Bellevue is. Yeah, well, jo it's of course Joseph Pulitzer. And Joseph Pulitzer came to New York and, and he bought the New York World, one of the big newspapers. And the Hearst Empire was basically um, his competition. And they went into what historians have later called the kind of yellow journalism, very sensational journalism. And what Pulitzer did was to hire a young female journalist reporter named Nellie Bly. Uh, some of you may have heard of Nellie Bly. She was a, a daredevil reporter who would do anything. When Jules Verne's wrote um, Around the World in 80 Days, Nellie Bly traveled the world in 76 days. Uh, <laughs> she was incredible. But, but one of her first big assignments was to act like a quote unquote crazy person, get arrested by the police, and get sent by a judge to Bellevue. And Nellie Bly went to Bellevue and fooled the doctors there into thinking she was crazy, and then wrote this um, uh, extraordinary expose called 10 Days in a Madhouse, about her experiences at Bellevue and then moving on to another uh, mental hospital. But from that point forward, Bellevue would be associated largely with a single affliction, and that would be mental disease, yes. Yeah. It's, quite it's quite extraordinary. I don't believe in the great man or great woman theory of history, but Nellie Bly had an enormous impact upon Bellevue. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 and I, th I thought that was fascinating. And it, it's interesting, Bellevue has to, you know, when you look at the economics of Bellevue, it's always sort of at the cusp of being underfunded. Yes. And um, then sometimes it's not just at the cusp, it is well below that cusp. Yes. Um, and so that kind of press sometimes can have a positive effect. It can. Um, and so it was interesting to, to see to, or to think about Bellevue's interactions with the press. I mean, her the press that she provided was just 
not helpful at all. But through the years, there were a number of other articles and stories that came out that probably helped to reinvest in Bellevue. So it it did. Um, obviously, even the Nellie Bly story was showed that Bellevue needed more money. Mm -hmm. It needed, needed more psychiatrists and were called alienists. It needed more alienists. It needed more space. Um, and the, the other thing that Bellevue has that virtually no hospital um, in America has is Bellevue has gigantic prison wards. The entire 19th floor of the hospital mm -hmm. is taken up with, I, I'm sure most of you have heard of Rikers Island. Um, the big prison in New York City. Anytime a Rikers Island inmate has a medical or psychiatric issue, that patient, the, the men are brought to Bellevue. So there's a psychiatric wing to the hospital and there's a medical wing to the hospital. And what the city realizes is that we are going to have to provide a certain amount of funding. Bellevue is always underfunded and understaffed, but in other words, if we want to protect the city, we are going to have to put money in and also, as Tammany Hall grew up, um, and there was uh, greater participation by particularly the Irish, but other immigrant groups, Bellevue was the hospital they were sending their people to. So they wanted a larger amount of funding. And one of the incredible things is that McKim, Mead, and White, which is the great architectural firm of that era, puts the designs together for the new Bellevue. My problem is that this was done in 1900. I have an office there in 2016, and it's the same building, yeah. right? And, and, but I should say, we, it was painted in 1934, so. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. In, in Mopton, right. in right. 2012. We, 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 don't, no, we no, don't go no, there, right. Um, <laughs> so um, there are a lot of great characters in, in the book. Um, and that's one of the wonderful things about your writing yeah. is you really, you follow a character. You get right. into, again, you teach us so much about them and how they're interacting with places mm -hmm. and the events of the time. Um, so do, which, is, which is your favorite? I, you know, Alexander Anderson was one, uh, one of my favorites. Um, I think Stephen Smith, the father of modern American public health, uh, what Stephen Smith did, in 1863, there had been horrible draft riots in New York City. Um, and the draft riots had been led by immigrant groups, particularly the Irish, who saw it as a rich man's war but a poor man's fight. And there, the riots had destroyed large parts of the city. And Stephen Smith was a medical reformer. And it was obvious to him that the bubbling over from the lower classes was going to affect the entire city. In other words, what had happened is you really were now having two cities. One was a city of immigrants who were very, very poor, had no medical care, who were dying early um, from alcoholism and industrial diseases and the like. And the other were the comfortable parts of the city. But what Stephen Smith tried to convince, and he did, the comfortable parts of the city, was that you better provide some money or you are going to have problems bubbling up from below that are going to keep this city in turmoil, and we're going to have one draft riot situation after another. And what the city did with Stephen Smith's help was to set up really the first major board of health for New York City and one of the first in the country. And this was a board of health that talked about vaccinating children. It was a, they actually put urinals in different parts of the city. Mm -hmm. They did away with, they used to drive cattle through various parts of New York. They would leave their waste everywhere. This no longer could be done. Um, tanneries had to be moved outside of the city. So uh, swill milk dairies that were selling inferior milk were closed down. So Stephen Smith is clearly one of the, one of the heroes. Um, to some degree, I think, you know, there, there are amazing people who went through Bellevue as students, and, you know, Walter Reed went through, Herman Biggs, the father of bacteriology, William Halstead, the, probably the greatest surgeon of that era. Um, two of the people I focus on are Salk and Sabin, mm -hmm. both of whom went to NYU Medical School and both of whom did stints uh, at Bellevue Hospital. And the reason they are important to me is whenever I teach a class, undergraduates as I did at the University of Texas, the students would always say to me, isn't it really a coincidence that 
the two pioneers of the different polio vaccines both went to the same medical school, NYU. And I have to explain to the students that it was no accident that when Salk and Sabin were coming of age in the early 20th century, virtually every major medical school in the East had Jewish quotas. Yale had one, Harvard had one, Penn had one, Columbia had one. Uh, uh, th they were everywhere. Cornell had one. The only school that did not have one was NYU. NYU did not have a Jewish quota. Indeed, about half of its medical students were Jewish. So it's no accident that Salk and Sabin went to NYU Medical School. For them, it was largely the only game in town. Mm. And that, to me, is important for people to remember. That, that, that there was something about the Bellevue NYU experience that was not an exclusive experience and it kind of represented the larger city as a whole. And if we, had time, if we have time, I'd also like to bring up, Clay, um, uh, Catherine Hinnant. Mm -hmm. um, this is a, an extraordinary story. Um, Catherine Hinnant was a young pregnant pathologist at NYU in the late 1980s. And she was raped and killed by a homeless man in her office in the hospital. The question then became, was this something that could happen at any public hospital, or was there something unique about Bellevue that brought this about? <clears throat> and the facts of the case were that Stephen Smith a different Stephen Smith than the one we talked about, the homeless man, had been living in Bellevue for weeks in a machinery shed. He had stolen doctor's scrubs, he had a stolen ID, and he wore a stethoscope around his neck, and he walked through the hospital. And Bellevue was only two doors down from the largest homeless shelter in New York City, and the 1980s were a time of a homeless explosion. And Bellevue had always been so compassionate that it just turned no one away. And what happened is that the homeless began to use the public areas of the hospital as sort of an extension of the shelter. They were everywhere. They were in lounges. They were stealing foods off patients' plates. And the question then became, is Bellevue a hospital or is it a bus station? Is it a place where it will deal with homeless people who have real medical problems, but try to, despite its compassion and its love and its trying to see that everyone gets a meal and a free coat and some shoes, that it has to have limits and draw the line? And Bellevue actually did draw that line. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oof. Yeah. Terrible it's an, that it's, it's an awful to, story. Yeah. yeah. Um, can you tell us um, about uh, Loretta Bender? I can. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Loretta Bender, um, if you would Google her today, uh, for those who are uh, who, who would remember her at all, she is seen by many as kind of the Nazi Dr. Mengele of the 20th century in America. <clears throat> Loretta Bender ran the children's psychiatric ward at Bellevue. And she actually was a loving, compassionate physician. Um, she was also one of the early pioneers in autism. And she believed, unlike others at that time, that autism was not caused by the quote unquote cold mother. Autism had biological, genetic, and deep psychiatric roots. But what Loretta Bender did was to take children as young as four years old and give them electric shock treatment. And that was, and she didn't hide it. She wrote about it in psychiatric journals. Um, obviously, there was no parental consent because most of these kids did not have parents who took care of them. They just wound up at Bellevue. But what Loretta Bender believed was that 
electric shock which was coming into being at this time and was seen as highly successful with many adults, that what electric shock might do was to clear the child's brain to the point where the child would be more readily adaptable to traditional psychiatric <clears throat> um, responses. So what she was trying to do was to see if we give the kid electric shock, will the kid do better under psychotherapy? Um, what she didn't really understand at the time, or maybe didn't want to understand, was that there were consequences to giving a child this young that kind of treatment. Um, so it's really a mixed bag with Loretta Benda. I think you know she was in many ways a psychiatrist ahead of her time, um, but she also used <clears throat> kind of the lack of informed consent and other things that we have in place today to her own advantage to do experiments on very, very vulnerable kids. Yeah, but it, you know, it's interesting to, like Hamilton, she was at the cusp of a, of a change that was going on in society um, where in the case of Hamilton, it was not using antisepsis. In the case, in her case, it was not using informed consent. That is correct. I mean, these were very difficult cases, and, and she thought she had a treatment that worked, and it does work and for right. some adults and kids. No understanding of long-term impact, Correct. of course. Correct. So it, it's interesting to think about. I, I, I thought your, <clears throat> your story of her was just so fascinating. The other thing about her that was amazing is, you know, as a woman, she... Um, she had an, an, an incredible career in academic medicine. She did, which until was quite she rare. reached the point at which she uh, she didn't adapt quickly enough and recognize the change. That, that, that is absolutely right. Um, she yeah. was what you would call a spousal hire. She was brought to Bellevue because her husband was a great psychiatrist. Her husband was a German Jewish refugee. Um, extremely brilliant, extremely eccentric, the kind of person who would walk across First Avenue with a huge stack of books on his arm and just signal to traffic to stop. Yeah. And one day it didn't, and he was killed. Yeah. Um, and she was left with three young children. We have some uh, students like that around here, by the way. We yes, right. We're driving through campus, you know what I'm talking about. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But she was in many ways ahead of her time. Uh, on the other hand, you're absolutely right that um, that when new, certainly new protective mechanisms for parents came in, uh, and for patients came in, Loretta Bender was looked at as uh, an anachronism, really, yeah, yeah. And, and, and perhaps a dangerous one. So you're, this is my last question, um, but you're, I just, uh, as, as one reads the book, um, you, you know, you're a historian, and you're telling us about the history, but your voice comes out. It does. Um, and, and it's quite clear that, that you love Bellevue. I do. And um, you start to hear it back in the 1700s, and you continue. It builds and builds throughout the book. You know, I don't know if that you wrote it that way, um, but regardless, you it, it, at least for the reader, grows as one gets through the book. So I, I just want to finish up by asking you about about your overall. You know, how do you feel about this place? I feel um, very close to Bellevue. Um, your office is in it. My by office the way, is in Bellevue, room. and it's unbelievable to be in a building where. Eight pizzas are going up to doctors, and medical waste is coming down in the same elevator. Yeah. You know, it's a very <laughs> schizophrenic in in, uh, in many ways. Um, it really is a remarkable hospital. Um, it was ground zero for the AIDS crisis. More patients died at Bellevue and were treated at Bellevue than anywhere else in the United States. Uh, when we had our lone Ebola patient in New York City, there was no doubt where that patient was going to be taken. Mm -hmm. It was to Bellevue. Um, and all of those things really mean a lot. I think what means the most to me as a child of immigrants is that the old immigrants are gone now. Uh, very few Irish in the hospital, Italian, uh, Jews. But what the hospital is filled with now are people from 
Latin America and Africa and Asia. More than 100 languages are translated at Bellevue. When a patient comes in, very few of them speak English. They put on headphones, the doctor puts on headphones, and they speak through an interpreter who has a great sense of not only of the language, but of the cultural intonations of that language. Um, to be perfectly honest with you, a large percentage of our patients today are undocumented, undomiciled, and uninsured. Mm -hmm. uh, they are the patients that other hospitals will either dump in our lap or will take for a while and then see if they can send them elsewhere. Um, Bellevue is the ultimate safety net. It is the place for people who have nowhere else to go. And the beauty of that is that they get quality medical care. You know, there's an affiliation contract with NYU. They provide extraordinary care to these people. And what really worries me, uh, and I think worries everyone, you know, public hospitals are dying out. Uh, some of them, the difference between many of them in Bellevue is not only the Bellevue tradition, but that Bellevue has, you know, first-rate medical people and first-rate nursing care um, at this institution. So the patients are <clears throat> really, really taken care of. New York City still, through its tax base, provides finances for Bellevue to do what it has to do. But when you're in a financial crunch, you're always underfunded and understaffed. The state provides some money, and the federal government provides some money, where they have what is called the disproportionate share hospital plan, where hospitals that take in lots of homeless people, undocumented people, get extra money. We're always worried that that budget is going to be lowered and lowered and lowered. It's so what we have now. is a medical staff ready to take care of these people forever, but we are never sure that the funding will last forever. And to see a flagship hospital like Bellevue, which has taken care of so many millions of people, and, and which has been the home for so much medical innovation and, 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 and just extraordinary generations of physicians coming through, and young house staff today who are so dedicated to that mission, to see that mission in any way injured or demeaned or lessened um, is something I, I do worry about. Yeah. Well, thank goodness for Bellevue in places like it. And thank, thank you, very you much. for drawing our attention to it. Really appreciate it. Thank you very thank much. You very much. Thank you. Thank you.